You're no different than any other guy. Oh, but I am. I'm a very special human being. Noble. And splendid. Cult classic The Swimmer from 1968 is beautifully shot, wonderfully scored, quite humorous, and uh, disturbing as all hell. A few months ago, I was browsing Amazon Prime, and the site recommended me a film called The Swimmer. The little thumbnail on it looked like some sort of second-rate romance film, and then I read the description. A man spends his summer day swimming in as many pools as he can, and I said, okay, <laughs> time to watch this right now. As the description of the film suggests, the basic setup of the film is that the main character, Ned Merrill, played by Burt Lancaster, is determined to swim home via a series of pools in the neighborhood. This is the day Ned Merrill swims across the county. Now, that premise might raise more questions and answers. When you first view The Swimmer, it's a bit of a jarring experience. As it unfolds, you're trying to decipher what type of film it is exactly. Is it strictly a satire on suburban life? Is it a slice of life? Perhaps a story of the main character having a midlife crisis and rediscovering himself. Or maybe it's even a horror movie of sorts with all this eerie music and evil dead shots in the woods. And he's liable to go on some rampage like Michael Douglas and falling down. I'm going home! I'm swimming home. One of the reasons why the film is so jarring at first is because of its ambiguity for much of its runtime. In the beginning of the film, Ned emerges from the woods like some sort of wild animal. And the big question is, where has Ned been? It's never quite answered, but maybe that's not important. The film offers you enough puzzle pieces for you to have a good idea of what the complete picture is. Ned Merrill essentially was once a businessman of sorts had a wife, two kids, pursuing the typical American dream in suburban Connecticut. And through a series of poor choices, whether that's him being a poor father, cheating on his wife, his general vanity, and so forth, he eventually lost it all. By the end of the film, it is revealed that his house is empty. His family had not been living there for quite some time, and that he's forced to confront the harsh truth. The short story written by John Cheever, in which this film is based on, states, was his memory failing, or had he so disciplined it in the repression of unpleasant facts that he had damaged his sense of the truth? Gonna go with the latter. So I kind of jumped from the beginning of the film all the way to the end, but I think it's important to know how the film ends in order to have a greater appreciation and understanding of the events that transpire throughout the film. There are a total of 10 different pools that Nettie takes a dip in, and it isn't until around the sixth pool, owned by the Hallorans, that things start becoming a bit clearer to the viewer, so you spend about half of the film in semi-confusion. However, as already alluded to, rewatches of the film are quite rewarding, as you pick up on small details that hint towards Nettie's situation and people's actual perception of him. For example, in pool number one, Nettie is talking to his neighbors about his epic plan to swim home. I can swim home. Come on, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to swim home? I don't get it. Pool by pool, they form a river. All the way to our house. Well, I suppose you could put it that way. Now, when you're watching this scene for the first time, there's a lot of weird glances that the characters give, as if Nettie appearing out of the wilderness and crashing their pool wasn't odd enough. But you initially interpret these reaction shots as them thinking that Nettie's plan of swimming is bizarre. But really, their concern and surprise more so stems from them knowing that he's trying to go to a place, his home, which no longer exists. It's not just reaction shots either that make you view things differently on a rewatch, but also what originally seemed like throwaway lines of dialogue. I want my girls to be married in that house. Throughout the film, you witness many interactions with characters and other events which represent Ned's progression into realizing the startling truth and also revealing the truth about his life to the audience as well. It's an interesting dynamic where you're sort of learning alongside the main character. In the beginning of the film, things perhaps start off promising for Ned. He has a goal of swimming across town, it's a beautiful day, he has a dream, uh, an American dream even, and then things start to unravel. You ever see such a glorious day? We're all gonna die, Shirley. As the film continues, it becomes increasingly difficult for Ned to accomplish his goal of swimming home. He becomes cold, his body aches, he's ostracized by others, the weather worsens, and by the tenth and final pool, things are spiraling out of control for old Nettie. The public pool at the end of his journey is claustrophobic, reiterated by the POV shots and the water splashing all over the lens. Not only does he have to contend with all the urine in the damn public pool, but then he has to confront his angry neighbors too, who put the screws to him. Wanna know what your girls thought of you, Mr. Merrill? Your girls laughed at you! I heard them. They thought you were a great big joke. There are some other things about the film that I like too. In pool number four, he comes across his children's former babysitter, Julianne Hopper. 
she temporarily joins him on his adventure, as she has a monologue about how much she liked Nettie when she was younger. And throughout this monologue, the scene is shot in such a way that it almost seems dreamlike. For an extended period of time, you never see either the characters' faces, as they're blocked by the trees and the sun, or just out of focus altogether. Julianne is going on and on about how great she thought Nettie was back in the day, and it seems like Nettie's almost fantasizing about an interaction that he would like to hear rather than what is actually real. And then soon afterwards, he does face the reality of it all, in a scene that's shot up close and in focus, where she reveals that she no longer has those feelings towards Ned, and then ends up running away from Nettie the Creep. There's a lot of nuts around. The film is very literary, which is no surprise given its source material, and at its core it's an allegory of Ned Merrill's decline over time. So the timeline and events are surreal at times rather than being literal. Rather than being a slice of life, the film is much more like life in a slice. Seasons change and his body wears down in just one day. And all of this is sort of like life in a way, right? You're stuck in a situation that's not exactly desirable. And before you know it, you've been living like that for months, even years. You have these ambitions and ideals, and before you know it, the American dream has passed you by. And you don't even know it until it's too late. The general themes of the film, time passing by, nostalgia, and confronting the ugly truth, are all pretty relatable for many people. In a lot of ways, the film is a snapshot of different periods of Nettie's life, confronting people from his past and slowly coming to terms with reality and having to confront the consequences of his past choices. You loved it. You loved it. We both loved it. You loved it! Poor bastard Ned never even had a pool, which is perhaps the ultimate status symbol in the social hierarchy in the town. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll get wet. One of the reasons why it's difficult to get a grasp on the film early on in your first viewing is because of how Ned is treated by his neighbors. Most characters are quick to treat him kindly, most of them put on smiles and laugh along with him, but at times you just chalk it up to them being phony and having surface level interactions where they get to brag about their epic pools. Next year we're getting all the luxury optionals, like a padded seat, a canopy. You ever see anything like it? Fifteen tons. I got a diatomaceous earth filler in there. 30,000 pounds of structural aluminum and clear plastic. Plastics. I'm not very much like Ned Merrill. I doubt many people are, but there are some qualities about him that make him oddly sympathetic at times, even though he's also a narcissistic shit heel too. He's a bit of a tragic hero, kind of like an Odysseus, which the film tries to channel. His pursuit of the American dream in the burbs has resulted in quite the contrary, the American nightmare. During the late 40s, single-family homes became increasingly popular in post-war America, and some people had these ambitions of a utopia of sorts with the design of their suburban neighborhoods at the time. Nettie presumably had his kids during the late 40s as well, and likely had these same aspirations to fit into the mold of the typical American family at the time too. By the late 60s, however, when the film was released, the original concept of suburban life started to fade away. It wasn't sustainable for everybody. Nothing's turned out the way I thought it would. When I was a kid, I... I used to believe in things. In cinema, there's typically two things that might happen with a character in a suburban setting. One, they would be outsiders who disrupted life in the neighborhood, and I guess Nettie is sort of like an outsider during the film, as he probably doesn't live close to there anymore. The second option is that characters would refuse to conform to the mindlessness or other negative characteristics that might be associated with the suburbs then. And that's present to an extent in The Swimmer, as Nettie talks to a kid in Pool Number 7 about being the captain of your own soul, and that kid seemingly struggles to fit in as well. And that kid could also represent the new age of youth youthfulness versus traditional values that people exhibited during the height of suburban life in the 40s and 50s. <sighs> that poor kid probably never got paid for that lemonade that he gave Nettie Bastard Merrill. I suppose I'll wrap things up here. The Swimmer has been out for over 50 years now, so I doubt I brought anything new to the table with this review, but I figured it was an underrated film that was worth shining a spotlight on since there aren't many YouTube videos on it. Anyways, the film is currently available to be viewed on Amazon Prime, or you could purchase the Blu-ray from Grindhouse Releases. If Sony Pictures has any issue with the copyrighted material in this video, well, as Nettie Merrill would say, I'll have my lawyers get in touch with you tomorrow. Yeah, you do that.